Bible reading this morning is taken from Colossians uh, chapter 2, verses 6 to 23. So that's beginning at verse 6 and ending at 23. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ." Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross." He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body nourished and knit together, through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These have indeed an appearance of wisdom in promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body, but they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that it is rich and it is deep and it brings us life. Thank you that when your word is proclaimed, your son is seen. And Father, that is our prayer this morning, that Jesus would be seen that Jesus will be loved and adored and worshipped. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, thanks very much, Ashley, for uh, that reading and prayer. And uh, hi again, everybody. Morning. You're having a great forum? Yeah, I am. Isn't it fantastic? Wasn't that launch of uh, Uncover John last night amazing? Just such a privilege as uh, someone kind of now outside the CU movement in local church work just to come back in for, uh, for, for an evening like that and sense what God is doing in the universities and colleges of our lands. I, uh, I won't forget yesterday evening in a hurry. Fantastic. And uh, our prayers are with you as uh, as churches in the UK. We're behind you, supporting you as you uh, carry forward this uh, amazing project for the glory of Jesus. Well, a friend of mine uh, recently took a courageous decision, a painful one uh, and a courageous one. It wasn't to come and camp at Forum, although I know that can be pretty painful and is definitely quite courageous, but this was something rather more personal. He's a Christian And he was dating this really nice girl, but she wasn't a believer. To be honest, my friend knew all along that it wasn't really what God wanted for him. And to everyone looking on, it was obvious that it wasn't doing him any good in his spiritual walk. But he felt a little bit trapped, and he didn't want to finish it. He didn't know what to do. But finally, God broke through in his life and convicted him. And though it was tough, he made the break. But what really struck me was what he said afterwards about why. Someone said, look, why did you do that? Why did you make that hard decision? And he just said this. He said, because in the end, Jesus is better. Jesus is better. Jesus is better. See, yesterday, the big question was, how big 
is your Jesus? Today the question is, is he sufficient for you? Is he enough? Is he enough to show you the Father truly? Is he enough to save you from the judgment you deserve? Is he enough to enable you to grow and flourish as a Christian and as a human being? Is he enough when your plans don't work out? Is he enough when the CU event you plan flops? Is he enough to give up something that you love? Is Jesus enough? Is he sufficient? I got married very soon after university, and uh, Alison and myself, uh, we were... We were ridiculously happy together, to be honest. It was wonderful. And uh, things looked good, and life seemed to promise so much as it stretched out before us. But within four years of leaving university, we were standing at the grave of our first son. He had lived just for two weeks. Three years later, we stood by the same grave again, burying our second son, who had been stillborn. Was Jesus enough when our prayers for healing seemed unanswered? Was Jesus enough when our plan of life wasn't working out and our hearts were full of pain? Well, I'm standing here this morning to say, yes, he was enough and he's still enough. He's enough for all of life. Colossians 2 is a stunning declaration and celebration of the sufficiency of Jesus. It's a proclamation that he isn't just big, though he is, he is also sufficient for us, his people. It's a chapter written in the teeth of opposition from people who claim to be Christian, but who were in effect saying that Jesus may be good, but in the end he isn't enough. He isn't sufficient. No one is entirely sure who the, uh, who the false teachers in Colossae were exactly. But the central kind of guts of their message seems to be that Jesus was fine for the basics of salvation, but that real spiritual satisfaction and fullness were to be found elsewhere. In what seems to be a kind of cocktail of, of legalism with Old Testament kind of uh, echoes in it and, and mysticism, combining ancient rules with underlying pagan superstitious assumptions. But the key point was, Jesus was not enough. But Paul is absolutely insistent in this letter. Jesus and the gospel are not just for the basics and the beginnings of the Christian life. He is enough for the whole of the Christian life. Have a look at the first two verses of the passage, verses 6 and 7. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, there's the beginnings Continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. That is a fantastic description, isn't it, of the healthy Christian life. How many of you have learned those two verses sometime? Okay, that's one. Well done. Fantastic. Those are two verses that you'd do well to learn. Carry them through life. It's a wonderful vision of what Christian maturity looks like. Firmly rooted in Christ and the gospel, always hungering to go deeper with him, and joyfully satisfied in all that he is to us and for us. Continue to live in him because Jesus is enough. Jesus is sufficient. Let's unpack Paul's argument. Four uh, ways in which he describes the sufficiency of Jesus. First of all, Jesus is sufficient because of who he is. Verse 9, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Now, as I'm sure you know, in the Old Testament, God chose to make his dwelling among his people, initially in the tabernacle and later in the temple. But now he has made his dwelling among us in Christ, the word who became flesh and tabernacled for a while among us. 
so that now we experience the presence of God, not in the, the partial and, and shadowy manner of Old Testament experience, but completely, because all the fullness of God dwells in him. Jesus is God in full HD. Jesus is God without remainder. All the fullness of God is in him. Jesus is sufficient because of who he is. The Bible's case for the existence of God is not fundamentally a philosophical argument, nor even a private mystical experience. It is fundamentally a person, a real person, a man named Jesus, who came to share in our human experience and who left his footprints in the sand of human history. We know that there is a God in heaven because he has come to us in his Son and lived among us in all his fullness on earth. And that's the conviction that Paul is articulating here for us. In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Because he is God, he can reveal God perfectly to us. Because he is human, he exists bodily, we can grasp and relate to that revelation. Just think for a moment more widely in Colossians as to who this Jesus is. We saw chapter 1 verse 15 yesterday. He is the image of the invisible God, the one who makes visible the God whom we cannot see. Chapter 1 verse 25, he is the word of God in its fullness, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Chapter 2, verse 2, he is the mystery of God in whom are hidden all the treasures of God's wisdom and knowledge. Stunning revelation of who Jesus is. And this union in the person of Christ of full deity and authentic humanity is permanent. Did you notice that? Chapter 2, verse 9, the present tense. In Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Jesus has lifted our humanity to the highest place. The dust of the earth sits on the throne of the universe as Savior, Judge, and King. Jesus is still a human being. Where else in the whole of religion and philosophy can you find anyone to compare to him? Where else will you find anyone who reveals God to you as Jesus does? Where else will you find anyone who possesses all the richness of God's wisdom and knowledge in himself as Jesus does? Where else will you find anyone who has lifted our humanity to the very throne of heaven? So given who Jesus is, why would you want anyone or anything beside him? In fact, who could you even imagine that you could put beside him? There is no Christless God, no God beyond Christ for us to seek. All the fullness of God is in him. He is peerless. He is utterly unique in his majesty, his glory, his wisdom and sufficiency. Now, what's happening in your heart right now as we think about the glory of Jesus? You just sit there thinking, oh, yeah, okay, there's another talk. Or is your heart lifting within you? Are you praising him? Are you adoring him? Are you loving him? One of the principles that I've tried to allow to guide my life increasingly is the, the, what I call the overflow principle of Christian service, which is that we can only minister to other people from the overflow of what God has first ministered to us. Any other form of Christian service in the end will, uh, will lead to exhaustion and burnout. We only minister from the overflow of God's prior ministry to us. And I want to say to you, it's hugely important for you that you nurture this sense of joy and satisfaction in the sufficiency of Jesus Christ in your life. Try and build into the rhythm of your life opportunities to just sometimes go out for half an hour's walk and, and just preach to yourself the wonder of the gospel and reflect on how good Jesus is and allow your heart to lift to him again in praise and adoration. He is sufficient because of who he is. And so Paul says to us in verse 8, we must keep him 
supreme and central, and never allow anyone to take us away. Verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. You don't need anyone else because Jesus is enough. So he's sufficient because of who he is. Secondly, he's sufficient because of what he has done in verses 10 to 15. Have a look again from verse 9. In Christ, all the fullness of the, body, uh, of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. Now, the false teachers in Colossae wanted to, to put alongside Jesus, as we've seen, this, this blend of Old Testament ritual and, and a kind of superstitious preoccupation with, with spiritual forces and powers. Paul tackles both of those here. He dismisses the concern with spiritual powers just with a phrase at the, at the middle of verse 10. Jesus is head over every power and authority. So if you've got Jesus, you don't need to worry too much about them. That's the implication. But how is he going to deal with the kind of Old Testament emphasis that, that's finding its way into the, the teaching of the false teachers? That's, that's going to demand more careful thought for Paul. Because he knows that, that if he undermines the Old Testament scriptures, he'll be soaring off the very branch on which he is sitting. So that's going to be yet more difficult for him to handle. What does he do? Well, he focuses in on the Old Testament practice of circumcision, which involved cutting off the male foreskin as a, a sign of, of uh, Israel's covenant with God. But he then reflects on the fact that even in the Old Testament itself, physical circumcision was seen as pointing beyond itself to the cutting off of the influence and power of sin from the heart of the believer. Circumcision of the heart was the ultimate circumcision. And so what Paul argues is that all that circumcision pointed towards and anticipated, Jesus has now done for us completely. Verse 11, in him, in Christ, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. How did it happen? Well, it happened with us being made one with Jesus in his death and resurrection, as is symbolized in Christian baptism. Verse 12, this happened having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. What's Paul saying? Well, he's saying this, united by faith with Christ, what is true of us is determined by what was true of him. So as Jesus died, your old life lived under the power of sin, died too. As he rose from dead, your new life began, a life in which sin is no longer your master. It's been stripped away from you as the controlling force in your life. That's the real circumcision, he says, and it happens through the cross and the resurrection of Jesus. So why go back to the old when you've already got everything that the old was pointing towards in Christ? It's very important, though, that we don't just think of the, uh, the, the cross as a kind of mantra. Sometimes I think we, we leave some of our friends a little bit confused. We say, well, yeah, Jesus died on the cross, and so we can be forgiven, and, and that's great, isn't it? And they say, well, how does, how does the death of a man 2,000 years ago, have anything to do with me and my forgiveness. I, I just don't get it. And so Paul explains how it works in verses 13 and 14. He says, When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, in other words, this whole deal is nothing, towards what, nothing to do with what we bring to the party. We, we, we were dead. We were in a mess. But when you were dead, God made you alive with Christ. He did it. He forgave us all our sins 
having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. You know, if you take out some kind of uh, loan, you have to fill in paperwork, which, which commits you to paying back a schedule of payments to, to pay back the debts that you owe. And that's the kind of idea here. Uh, the, the, a, a legal document which lays out the debt of obedience to God, the universal debt of obedience to God that we owe to him as our creator. So there it is. All the, uh, all the debt we owe him, the perfect obedience we, obey, we owe to him as our creator. It's our kind of I owe you to God. But of course, the trouble is that rather than settle that debt of obedience, we have rather tarnished our humanity with sin so that this I owe you document now becomes a, a charge list of our failure, condemning us and standing against us. That's what verse 13 is talking about. But then read verse 14 again. He cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Did you get that? He cancelled it. He took it away. He nailed it to the cross. Because Jesus, the only human being who ever obeyed the, the Father perfectly, paid the penalty of our disobedience for us. He bore the wrath that we deserved in our place. And because he has done that, Paul can say he forgave us all our sins. The cross has done the whole job. There is nothing left to pay. Don't you want to shout out hallelujah or praise God or something? Sound a bit enthusiastic? Yeah. If only we were in Africa, Ray. And because he's paid the whole price, he has silenced the evil powers ranged against us. Because his announcement of forgiveness trumps all their accusations. Verse 15, having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Now, I want you to think for a few moments about what this means for you and for me in the reality of our lives. Will you think just quietly where you are, if you can bear it, of the thing that you have done of which you are most ashamed, the thing that sometimes you wonder if God can really forgive, the thing that sometimes Satan loves to mock you with and, and make you wonder, look, you did that, you can't really be saved at all, can you? Maybe it's something further back in the past. Maybe, honestly, it's the fact that you just made a complete mess of the summer and you're kind of feeling a bit of a fraud being here. Just think about that for a moment. And now with that thought in your mind, let the word of God, the gospel of Jesus, speak its powerful truth into your life. He forgave us all our sins. Every one of them. Now, who are you going to believe? Are you going to believe the word of God or the accusations of Satan? Jesus has done it. Forgiveness is real. The cross works. And now think of those sins which trip you up time and again. And, and you find yourself sometimes saying, oh, it's just me. It's just who I am. It can never change. Again, let the word of God speak deep into your life. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. And God has made you alive in Christ. The old you ruled by the flesh has been stripped away by him. It doesn't have the right to be in charge in your life anymore. So take your eyes off yourself. Take your eyes off your failures and lift them to Jesus, the lover of your soul, and love him so much that you start to become like him because that's what he saved you for. He is the all-sufficient Savior because of who he is and because of what he has done for us. So I want to encourage you, savor the Savior, enjoy him, love him, worship him, never move from the cross and the empty tomb, but cherish what he has done for you there. And don't go looking for other 
saviors. Remember, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your life in him. We look for other saviors in so many places, don't we? Sometimes we look to our academic or career success to be our savior. That's the thing that's going to give us the significance we crave. Sometimes we look to our possessions or the approval of our friends to be our savior. That's going to give us the sense of security and belonging that we're really after. Sometimes, and this is a particular danger for us here, we look to our Christian service to give us a sense of worth and identity. We want it to be our savior. The trouble is when we start to treasure and depend on any of those things, when we start to look to them to be our savior, they become idols to us. And the thing about idols is they never deliver on their promises. Oh, they may appear to give you the security, the significance, the sense of worth that you look for, but actually they just keep on taking more and more and more from you, and they don't give you back anything in return, nothing at least that lasts. Tie your sense of significance to your success and what's going to happen the moment you fail. Tie your sense of security to what you have and the opinion that others have of you and what's going to happen when all of it gets stripped away and your friends reject you. Tie your sense of identity to your CU leadership and then what happens when your CU doesn't grow and you have to hand on the role to someone else. No, none of these things, though often good in themselves, none of these things are fit to be your savior. There is only one savior, and his name is Jesus, and what he has done is enough. So don't go looking for any substitutes. Now, just as briefly as I can, two kind of conclusions in the last Four verses, uh, the last few verses. Jesus is sufficient because of who he is. He's sufficient because of what he's done. Now, Jesus is sufficient for our growth as Christians. The false teachers in Colossae, as we've seen, were basically saying that, f- that real growth, real spiritual fulfillment comes from two things. It comes from religion and from mystical speculation. And they were then saying that Christians who weren't into those things were effectively second rate and not really going anywhere. But in the light of who Jesus is and what he's done, Paul is saying, look, that is just nonsense. Verse 16, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival or a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. Don't let anyone judge you for that. That isn't the measure of spiritual maturity and growth. You know, it's, it's an old lie, but I think it's still around. It goes like this. Become a Christian through a nice, simple, naive, evangelical gospel, but then grow to maturity through the discovery of the riches of religion. I, I've seen it time and again. The sharp edge of gospel faith in young lives like many of you here this morning, then made blunt through the apparently more sophisticated lure of religion. Paul says, actually, it works the other way around. It isn't that the gospel leads us on to its superior fulfillment in religion, but conversely, that religion, at least in its Old Testament sense, leads us to the superior fulfillment of the gospel. That's what verse 17 says, isn't it? All this stuff, in verse 16, was a shadow of the things that were to come, but the reality is found in Christ. See, the gospel isn't just the beginning that you then move on to and become really sophisticated religious believers. No, the gospel is the beginning, the middle, and the end of the Christian life. It's the whole deal. And all of the Old Testament was pointing towards it. So now we've got the reality. Don't go back. A couple of summers ago, I had a very cold camping experience. Thankfully, it was dry, but it was really cold. We were camping uh, just in uh, Interlaken in Switzerland, fantastic, beautiful place. 
And we were camping uh, in the shadow of three huge alpine mountains, the Eiger, the Munch, and the Jungfrau. And much of the day, we actually spent in the shadow of those huge peaks as they were blocking out the sun. Now, honestly, the shadows were quite striking. You could look up on one side of the valley and see the outline of the peaks being projected onto the mountains the other side. And, and it, was, it was kind of quite impressive and, and interesting. But the moment you turned from the shadows and looked at the peaks, it was so breathtaking that you would never give those shadows another thought. They were just nothing in comparison. So it is that the gospel throws its shadow way back into the feasts and the practices and the patterns of Old Testament faith, with all of them in some way being shaped by, by the Christ to whom they pointed. But now he's come. He's the fulfillment. He's the reality. So now we've got the reality. Who would want to return to the shadow? And in the same way, verse 18, he says, preoccupation with, with mystical speculation is not a sign of spiritual maturity. Rather, it's the sign of people who have lost their way. Verse 19, they have lost connection with the head, with Jesus, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. You see the implication? Where does growth come from in the Christian life? Not by turning away from Jesus to other things, but by drawing more and more deeply from him. It's from him that we together within the church grow into spiritual maturity. So go to the cross again and again and again. See the ugliness of human sin. Own it as your own. And then see the beauty of divine love and embrace it into the depths of your soul. Go to the empty tomb again and again. See the bankruptcy of your idols and celebrate the victory of Christ. Look to the right hand of the Father and see him exalted and enthroned as your great high priest and receive his grace, his daily grace, his new every morning grace into the deepest places of your soul. Cherish him above everything else until you cherish nothing else beside him because that is the Christ-shaped reality of authentic Christian maturity. He's sufficient because of who he is. He's sufficient because of what he's done. He's sufficient for your ongoing growth and life as a Christian. And he is finally sufficient, verses 20 to 23, for our transformation and holiness. This is our main theme tomorrow morning, so I'll only just mention it. The world is full of, of self-help therapy of both religious and secular kinds with all its programs and rules for self-discovery and fulfillment and personal change. But Paul's verdict is very damaging. He says, however such techniques may appear to change our behaviors, the problem is they don't change the basic orientation of our hearts. Verse 23, such regulations have the appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. They don't change your heart. Only Jesus can do that. Come back tomorrow morning to find out more. But just before we finish, I want to leave you with the truth and the challenge of this passage. The fullness of God is in Christ. And there is fullness in Christ for us, his people. He is sufficient. Sufficient to show you the Father because of who he is. Sufficient to save you because of what he's done. Sufficient to grow you. Sufficient to transform your heart. Sufficient when everything else is taken away. Sufficient when things don't turn out as you hoped. Sufficient when your CU is thriving. Sufficient when your CU is going pear-shaped. Sufficient when your life is full of joy. Sufficient when your life is filled with pain. Sufficient when he's blessing you with lots of things sufficient still when he's asking you to give up precious things for him and the gospel. Sufficient even when you can't understand his ways in your life. 
Jesus is enough. And we don't need to go in pursuit of any other. So this morning, in the quiet, I want to ask you to identify and name and weed out and renounce the idols of your heart and resolve instead to set your heart fully on Jesus, the all-sufficient Christ. Let's pray as the band come to lead us in a final song. And in the stillness of uh, this place, just do business with God in your heart. What are the other saviors that you're looking to? What are the other things that you hope to find security and significance in? The idols that you cherish. Just see their bankruptcy. Name them before God. And in your heart, renounce them. Turn from them. Embrace Jesus. Lord Jesus, we praise you that all the fullness of God lives bodily in you. And we praise you that we have been given fullness in you. We thank you that you are enough. Lord, some of us maybe have tough decisions to make as we respond to the challenge of your word this morning. Give us grace to make those hard choices that will dethrone our idols and place you central as Lord and Savior and King. But most of all, fill our hearts with joy and celebration at all that you are to us and for us. For the sake of your glory. Amen.